Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here uh, today. Uh, thanks for, uh, for John uh, for his, uh, his talk, which is very enlightening, and uh, I look forward to following up with, uh, with some details on some of the things that uh, we've been up to uh, in British Columbia, as well as uh, with my colleagues uh, Cindy Orser um, and Aaron uh, Hilliard from uh, DigiPath Labs uh, in Las Vegas. Um, <clears throat> Essentially, you'll notice that uh, there's, there's going to be a lot of parallels there with, uh, with John's talk. So uh, I think you've seen uh, these uh, illustrations of the plant morphology. Um, and I like to refer to, uh, to cannabis as uh, essentially a single species with multiple gene pools. And as we all know, and, and what we've talked about uh, a lot today, is the fact that um, the influence of cannabis on humans and vice versa has uh, been nearly disproportionate in nature in the sense that um, what you can see here on this current map is uh, what I would say is the origin of different morphologies of, of cannabis without referring to, to anything uh, more than just the morphology and the size of the leaves. Uh, so you see uh, narrow leaf hemp, uh, NLH, uh, kind of in Europe there, uh, the broad leaf drug type, uh, and the narrow leaf drug type, which those would be the indica sativa of the uh, recreational or the medical market. And then the broad leaf hemp, uh, which is more thought of as being the Chinese hemp. Um, so essentially, uh, th these would be the, you know, uh, kind of a primer of, of where the plants uh, emerged and evolved. Uh, and essentially, as we know, it's moved around the world. Uh, and um, there's hybrids between most likely all of those gene pools at this point. Um, broadleaf and uh, narrowleaf hemp have hybrids. And obviously, I think when we refer to drug type cannabis these days, we're really referring to a large hybrid gene pool uh, of both um, broadleaf drug type and narrowleaf drug, drug type, so Afghanica and kind of South Asia origin uh, with some of the autoflowering traits um, and possibly. Uh, well, specifically autoflowering traits originating from northern latitudes, so typically European hemp uh, that was introgressed. Um, but in essence, you know, what we see is that we have um, a natural process of moving a plant around the world, and then we have the impact of um, artificial selection like humans have had on any other crop. Uh, and here's a, here's a paper from uh, uh, Ernie Small. Uh, who essentially illustrates uh, what this means. And so we have on the one side the fiber cultivars, uh, and then we have more the narcotic uh, cultivars. And, and the concept here is that there was divergent selection, uh, selective pressures by the people that were essentially collected these plants and then selected them for very different reasons, whether, um, you know, let's say broad categories of drug cultivars versus um, hemp cultivars. Uh, this relates to, um, this is the same paper, or another paper by, by, um, by Ernie Small as well, but this relates to the question everybody asks, hey, let's get, you know, is it good to do commodity cannabinoids from hemp grown outdoors, or are we better off focusing on, you know, growing indoor in a controlled environment, uh, a drug, drug type uh, cannabis? Uh, so essentially what you see here and what this table shows is that there is um, a significant difference in between the size of trichomes uh, in drug type cannabis versus um, fiber type cannabis, so versus hemp versus uh, marijuana, uh, there is here essentially almost a uh, you know, 1.6 time larger size uh, of trichomes in, um, in drug type cannabis. So essentially you can see that this plant was purpose bred for resin production. So essentially having larger trichomes, maybe more numerous trichomes is also uh, one of the key features there. And essentially for me at this point in time, I think that's the large difference between hemp and, and cannabis is really the you know, that's why we capped at 5% when we're talking hemp that hasn't been integrated with uh, that key trait of resin production. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna go over the, the uh, solar paper because obviously it was just covered, but what I did do here is, um, is essentially um, delve a little bit deeper into that, that concept of um, the divergence between these two gene pools, in particular European hemp uh, and drug type cannabis. And this is work um, done recently, published at the end of 2017 um, by a group that I did uh, my undergrad thesis and my master's thesis at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, where I'm from. Uh, so um, uh, essentially my, uh, uh, my master's advisor, uh, Jérôme Goudet, and uh, one of my, um, my committee members uh, were the, the lead investigators on this study. And the interesting part um, about this study 
is that they use the type of genetic markers called single sequence repeat or microsatellites. And the interesting part with those is that those um, markers are typically thought to not be under the effect of selection. So they're typically thought of being neutral. So it means that it's, it's basically immune to the effect of people moving stuff around and essentially more so breeding for specific purposes. So neutral areas of the genome, they don't code for genes, but they might be associated with genes. So I think it makes more sense to use neutral markers when we're trying to decipher uh, the evolutionary history of a particular, um, you know, a particular structure that we're observing. Uh, and in this case here, we do see, uh, as you can see here from uh, the, uh, the green um, <coughs> uh, plot on the right there, every single one of these bars is an individual plant. So there's a, a 1,234 plants sampled here uh, out of 48 populations. Um, and I think this is probably the first population level study on, on cannabis sativa uh, where we have, you know, thousands of individuals and dozens of populations. Um, so essentially red and, and green separates uh, that, uh, these two gene pools between hemp and, uh, and drug type cannabis. Um, and then you see that there is um, uh, essentially, you know, a clear pattern of structure, uh, but there's, there's not, not much more that we can see from this image. So thankfully, uh, to, um, to these authors, they, um, <clears throat> they essentially um, shared their data. So I downloaded the data from, uh, from the PLOS One website uh, and repeated those analyses uh, and added some <clears throat> essentially labels to it, but also um, going beyond that, uh, seeing a, a particular structure where we have uh, on the top right essentially the monoecious varieties of, of, of European hemp and, um, and as, we, as, as we go kind of from the, the blue colored uh, to the yellow colored, we're now uh, going towards dioecious hemp. So essentially, a, a monoecious hemp being a hermaphrodite uh, variety, as opposed to the dioecious kind of being what, what we're, what, what's common for us to understand that we have both a male and a female plant. And it's interesting to see, and it, and it makes sense there, that obviously the, the dioecious um, um, hemp uh, cluster closer to, um, to the uh, narrow leaf drug type. Uh, and then we see uh, essentially divergence towards uh, the broadleaf, indica, afghanica, whatever we want to call it. But it, it really is quite interesting that we can, we can tease apart a pattern here uh, from you know, a, larger, um, a larger pool of, um, of samples <clears throat> than what had been seen previously using um, you know, single nucleotide polymorphism, which are you know, possibly uh, both functional or under selection and also neutral. So I want to talk more about SNPs. Um, uh, John mentioned them. Essentially, this is what they look like here. It's a single pair difference uh, on a, a sequence. It's one of the most common, uh, <clears throat> some, one of the common uh, uh, sources of polymorph polymorphism. So essentially, the, the source of variation that's the most commonly found. Uh, it is typically thought to arise from a mistake uh, in replication uh, from one, um, basically from one cell cycle to the next. And um, it's also one of the means of you know, generating diversity, so using uh, mutagens and things like that. Uh, but nature does it all on its own. Uh, it doesn't necessarily require us, and typically we see an average frequency of about uh, one SNP for every thousand base pairs. And when we're talking about the cannabis genome, we see that that's actually, uh, there's actually quite a bit more SNPs. So large amount of diversity, about one SNP every um, 100 base pairs in, in cannabis. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, what I want to talk about here, and this is an example from one of the licensed producers in Canada that uh, I, uh, I knew their uh, horticultural director, and uh, they came, he came to me and said, something very interesting happened in, in one of our strains that we bought from the BC Bud Depot, which is probably not the most recognized uh, seed source, um, but essentially they have a variety called Shiatsu Kush, which they claim is from Japan, which it's not, but uh, it's typically a high THC uh, variety, and then here in this case, as you can see, something happened in the production line that caused one plant to express CBG uh, in equal, uh, almost in equal uh, concentration to, um, to, to um, THCA acid. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a mutation, it could be something else, it could be an insertion of a transposable element right inside of an active THCA synthase gene. Uh, but it's really quite interesting how one of the reasons why they pick this up is because they have to, they have to QA, QC test their products and when, when, the, uh, when the one sample test comes back with a high CBG, they don't believe that it's happening, so they resend the same plant, and they see that actually something happened to one of the clones, um, and I'm happy to see that they're actually uh, producing it as a plant and offering it as a, 
you know, as, as medicine to people that, uh, that would be interested in you know, <clears throat> having access to different minor cannabinoids. So these things can happen, you know, if a mutation can happen in a, in a small ACMPR greenhouse or, or, uh, or a grow house in Whistler, Canada, uh, you know, it, it's definitely happening in those fields out there all the time. We're just not looking for it because of the scales we're growing at. Um, so this is something that I, that I did essentially using data from, from medicinal genomics, and I, you know, part of the reason why I'm here is because uh, of uh, the, the philosophy of sharing this type of information with people to be able to, you know, there's a lot of information. We can't all, uh, you know, go through it and decipher it. So uh, here's an example, and I've got the, the NRC logo up here, and that's uh, a little bit of a, um, a wave to, uh, to John Page because as you see the USO31 and the phenol samples there came from them. So this is all in silico data downloaded from the internet. Um, and um, again, thanks to uh, medicinal genomics um, and, uh, and John's group for sharing that data. Um, essentially what I do is, um, is use statistical approaches to be able to now uh, you know, decipher genomics and, and make it a little bit more approachable and maybe fast track some of these developments as we're talking about marker-assisted selection. So here you see that, that, that clustering, like we said, we've got phenol out there, hemp, and then we have the drug type cannabis that have some kind of a structure. But again, this is done with uh, 28 accessions um, and starting with 100, 180,000 a uh, data set with 180,000 uh, SNPs. Uh, so what I did is in silico, I managed to use uh, statistical analyses like discriminant analysis of principal component to reduce this 180,000 SNP data set to a set of 42 that in silico on the computer provided the exact same pattern. Uh, and here's something that I did also way back in the day, a 3D PCA that then was uh, um, used by some other groups that are presenting their data uh, in, a, in, a, in a fashion like this, but it's the same principle here. We see that there is a clustering going on, but again, you know, a very basic um, 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 structure that we see. <clears throat> so here's uh, what I set out to do with, a, with another follow-up study in 2017 was uh, essentially compare the indica sativa uh, uh, paradigm. So what I, I took data from the internet on, on terpene expression, uh, and then what I did there is that I, I forced the software to say, okay, on the left here, I'm gonna say indica sativa hybrid. How do they differentiate themselves? As you can see, they're all overlapping. And I tested a couple of options, including uh, some of what the NAPRO uh, research had done, which they said, I think it was limonene, caryophylline, uh, and myrcene. Uh, so I, I did that, and then I, I did another, essentially, uh, clustering um, possibility, which was myrcene, terpenaline, and limonene. As, as you can see, this was kind of what was the best a cluster that I showed. And essentially what I did from that is I took the genetic data, constrained it based on these three classes, and was able to have a data set that, that almost perfectly clustered these groups into their relevant uh, groups here. This is more of a proof of concept, um, <clears throat> but essentially this data is available on the internet. I have uh, these uh, 21 markers that are uh, available for people to download and play with. Uh, and again, this is really just uh, digested information from, from Canopedia. Um, so the study with, uh, with terpenes and digipath really kind of came as a follow-up to that. And, uh, m you know, going from, uh, you know, 70-something uh, samples to now about 5,000 samples. And this is all terpene data. So you see all of the variables there, limonene, blah, blah, blah. And you see how essentially the software can uh, uh, cluster these groups into, into three different groups. And this is just drug type cannabis, but typically, uh, you know, a myrcene, beta caryophylline dominant in red, uh, a terpenaline dominant uh, group, and then a limonene dominant group with obviously some other terpenes in there. But we get a really consistent clustering of these three groups based on their, on their chemo, chemo, uh, chemotypic data. So what I did is the same kind of concept using fancy statistics to, uh, to simplify and, and really actually generate um, synthetic variables uh, called principal components. And, um, <clears throat> and here, what you can see is out of those uh, 5,000 individuals, 70 samples that were uh, sequenced essentially with a similar genotyping by sequencing approach uh, by, uh, by medicinal genomics, and you see that there is, there's still, um, that cluster still holds essentially, and there's still some, there's some overlap there, and it, it, it's not a perfect fit, but essentially from that data set, I was able to, um, to generate 48 um, sets of, of primers, 
um, that I wanted to validate from the in silico uh, on the computer studies to now being able to say we can do this in the lab in a repeatable fashion. Uh, so interestingly, out of 48 markers, we really only had about uh, 23 that uh, were validated. So nine of them just never even amplified. So I think it's based on the large amount of SNPs uh, in the priming areas of, of the primers. Um, we found that 16 that showed polymorphism on, on, on in silico data were actually monomorphic, even between hemp and cannabis. Um, and um, Three minutes. Essentially, the, out of that, 18 of them were associated with terpene expression as well. Um, and here's just an, an idea of the assignment where we compare the, the genome uh, GBS, so 10,000 SNPs against 18 SNPs. You can see that the, uh, the um, statistical assignment to the different groups is very, very close, uh, you know, with essentially uh, 1,000 times less markers. Um, and this is also uh, being confirmed by some other groups. Uh, essentially, this is a study out of, uh, of uh, New Mexico that shows the same kind of clustering with myrcene, uh, terpenoline, and limonene. Um, and um, this is something that I validated uh, with a licensed producer uh, in British Columbia that I work with called the Flower Corporation, where essentially now we've taken, uh, we see hemp here clustering by itself, and those are X59 and phenola samples, a myrcene dominant group. Uh, what we see here is the little cloud, the green cloud, that's actually a pinene dominant accession that has pinene and myrcene, but pinene is quite a bit higher. Um, and, uh, and you can see at the bottom the pink, is, uh, is hemp samples, and so they're not all distributed in one part, but they, you can identify hemp very easily with this, uh, with this approach. Uh, I'm not sure what this is, I don't see it, but this is interesting. I'm showing the same data here, and what it shows is the, the markers that are associated with the clustering. So on the top left there is hemp, and we see uh, mito, so it's a mitochondrial marker that's always uh, uh, fixed in hemp, and then SW6, which is actually a THC synthase marker that I developed that enable you to irrefutably identify hemp, uh, so CBD hemp versus CBD uh, drug type cannabis anyways. Um, and then the same, when you look at hemp, there's uh, different phenotypes in the fields that are also associated with, uh, you know, the height and also the, uh, the fragrance of the plants. Uh, and then again, you know, the last thing that, um, that I did is essentially take these, this small set of markers, so actually just 23 of them, and I took all the data from Canopedia, One and I minute. wanted to see how, uh, how, you know, if we're able to identify strains. And again here, I identified a few of them, but one of the... Well, you know, one of the, the data that, uh, that they show is a glute clustering in a lot of the Blue Dream uh, accessions, and the same with the Durban poison. Uh, so it's just nice to see that, you know, this actually translates across, across the board. And thank you so much, everybody, for the attention. Not much time for questions, uh, but uh, yeah. Round of applause.